Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Richard Wender. Dr. Wender is the Chief Cancer Control Officer of the American Cancer Society, and I would say in Atlanta, but I know he um, actually resides in a number of locations, so um, partially in Atlanta, um, which is the, a home, the home to the American Cancer Society. Um, at the ACS, he helps lead the only comprehensive cancer control organization in the world and drives the effort to transform the face of cancer in the U.S. and around the globe by developing strategies for access to care, patient navigation, and health equity. Um, briefly, prior to joining the Society's staff in 2013, Dr. Wender provided extensive volunteer leadership at the organization's state and local levels. Um, and in 2006, he was elected national president of the society, becoming the first primary care physician to serve in this capacity. Um, Dr. Wender has worked for more than three decades as a family physician in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where from 2002 until 2013, he served as alumni professor and chair of the department. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Wender. Thanks, thanks so much, Nicole. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this important forum and discussion. A couple of very introductory remarks. One, it's, this is a fairly ACS-centric presentation. That was my assignment to talk about how ACS tackles the problem. A little different than what we normally do. Normally, we talk about this problem. We're talking about it from the patient and caregiver and, and general public perspective, but I think very relevant to it. And second, uh, my, my colleague, our, our chief medical and scientific officer, uh, Dr. Len Lichtenfeld, is here, here, and he is somebody who's lived and breathed this for many, many, many years. It's been a, an enormous part of how we communicate uh, to uh, the public and many other venues. So with that introduction, here we go. We're in the middle of strategic planning right now, and we asked Monitor de Deloitte to ask the universe around us, what do people expect of the American Cancer Society? What do they want us to do? And this emerged, not the only recommendation, as one of the most important. People expect and organizations expect that the ACS will be a trusted source for information about cancer, will convene and help lead, will embrace health equity, and will focus on patients and care caregivers as, as, a general, uh, as well as the general public. <clears throat> but this issue of trust uh, came out repeatedly in, in all of the landscape review that we did. So how do we view uh, uh, this general issue of information? And to us, it falls under the very broad rubric of uh, enhancing access to high quality care. And we view access comprehensively to strive and meet, uh, to meet and anticipate needs. Uh, we work on insurance coverage, which we a critical measure of uh, accessibility, affordability, navigation. We've heard a lot about that. Uh, direct patient service provision through issues like transportation and lodging. Uh, but perhaps nothing is more strongly and consistently connected to ACS. Research would be the other, I think, comparable kind of image that people have of ACS. Uh, but the other half of that is being a source of information. Uh, and the public does see us as a trusted source for information about cancer. Uh, so how do we look at providing information? Uh, and our, our, our thought is that this is a 360 effort, uh, <clears throat> approaching people where they are, how they gather information, how they access information. Uh, perhaps the, the most important, although we haven't judged relative importance, uh, we can just do it in terms of quantity, is our website, cancer.org. Uh, last year, we had 120 million hits to cancer.org. It's the most accessed cancer website in the world. 40% of the hits come from outside of the United States. It's used around the world. Uh, we have uh, a, 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 the NCIC, our National Cancer Information Center, open 24 hours a day, 365 days uh, a year, staffed by about 460 people, uh, and a major part of how we provide information. Uh, we've shifted from just being phone calls to now doing online chats as well. We have a digital strategy as part of our strat planning. We're looking at how we enhance that. We conduct health marketing campaigns, uh, such as one we did recently on HPV vaccination. Um, we provide personal guidance, and we shouldn't underestimate that, that if you work or volunteer for ACS, you're frequently asked to serve and in, to interact with the media, to talk to patients and caregivers facing cancer, uh, and we all feel that shared responsibility. We publish books, 
still, less than we used to, but we still do publish books. Um, and of course, we publish journals, and our journals are an important source of information. Here are the principles that guide our approach to providing information. Uh, and I've tried to keep them very short list. Evidence-based, comprehensive, easy to understand, recognize that we're often, not always, but often deal, uh, interacting with people who were recently diagnosed with cancer, and as we discussed with this morning, that has implications. And number five, it's everyone's responsibility to do this. So let me walk you through these. So number one, evidence-based. <laughs> this is, I think, our most important kind of rock-solid principle, is that our information is based on science, uh, and we, we hold to that no matter what other pressures are coming our way. Sounds easy, but sometimes it's not so easy to do that, and we try to really use that as our anchor. Just to give you an example of how we do it, our content team alone, I'm not talking about uh, our research team, and our this is just people who work in our content area, include two oncologists, uh, oncology nurses, social workers, and then numerous other trained individuals. But we call on content experts, excuse me, throughout the organization, so it's not just the people who work specifically for the content team. We have a robust collection of resources in addition to our website, including journals, books, fact sheets, and we still do use brochures. I like the, the calling out for having patient brochures. We're still in that space. Uh, and we also do not hesitate to be honest when evidence is lacking. We will tell people that we just don't have the science to comment on that. Number two, our offerings are comprehensive. So our goal is to provide actionable and understandable information for every issue relevant to cancer. Every issue. Uh, we, uh, we tackle causes of cancer, uh, lifestyle guidance, screening guidelines and information, uh, information about your diagnostic workup and where patients may stand if they call us and ask information through treatment, survivorship, palliative care, end of life, for every patient, for every cancer. Nothing to it, very simple, just every cancer, every patient. So uh, it's a big goal, but that's what we hope to do. Uh, second principle, we present information in a way that's easy to understand. Uh, so we do everything we can. In, in, in many respects, if you look at our content team, this is their, uh, you know, first they begin what is the science, but then the content team spends an enormous effort, has a lot of expertise, in translating this complicated information into ways that are easier to understand. We do use a literacy tool for the information we produce. You know, as anyone who's worked with a literacy tool knows, it's never perfect. Some things are very complex, but we do our best to do that, to address both patient and caregiver needs. But it's important to realize we're also prepared to provide information at a higher literacy level for those who are looking for it. So we try to do that as well. Uh, we, I think, do very well for English and Spanish. But beyond English and Spanish, so we have a full-time um, Spanish-speaking team, both at our, uh, in our content team that does our website and in the, uh, so it's original Spanish material. It's not translated from English. And then we also have a full-time Spanish-speaking team at the National Cancer Information Center. But beyond that, it is more spotty. So I didn't count all the languages that we address. It's many, but it's not comprehensive. And it often depends on whether we got a specific grant to support work or if we have an international partner who will help produce our material in another language. So uh, that's, I think, one of our biggest challenges. If I could wave a magic wand, wish that uh, we could address all the varied languages that we'd like to. Uh, number three, we're well aware, as was discussed this morning, that we are dealing with people facing stress. Uh, cancer, I, I love this word, I put the word can prompt. I think we can all agree that the word can can be changed to does, will, consistently, prompts worry, anxiety, fear. Uh, it tends to lower people's ability to absorb and understand information. So I'd love it if you, and we've had many people have listened to uh, de-identified recordings of our call center staff talking to cancer patients. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, and they get eight weeks full-time training before they're allowed to answer calls themselves. You have to be a college grad to work in our call center. Uh, so it's not a typical, you know, MasterCard call center, for example. Uh, 
uh, but they're really remarkable at staying very even keeled uh, and presenting information that's often emotional, very simple, very patient. Uh, and one of my favorite calls, or types of calls I've listened to are, are individuals who go to the doctor and then they come back and the next call they make is to us just to say, you know, what was that? <laughs> you know, what, what, here's what they told me, what does that mean? And it's so interesting because we often hear kind of the feedback we heard this morning of, you know, so good to get the information from somebody I really know I can trust and rely on. Well, they're talking to a college graduate without a medical degree. They just came from their oncologist. So it, it takes a, a village to really provide the kind of information we need to. Number four, everyone at ACS is responsible for providing information. So at every level, has to feel comfortable uh, directing people if they can't directly provide the information, uh, helping people know where to go for answers. And like so many here, um, how many, you know, if I asked anyone who's in the cancer field, have you ever served as an unofficial navigator for a patient? I suspect every hand would go up. And if you work for American Cancer Society, you better believe that no matter what part of the department you're in, you get calls from people, can you help me? Can you help direct me? So there's a lot of this unofficial navigation that we do take very seriously and try to meet. So what's the unique role that we play? Well, we're very aware of this trust over our 107 years, I think we're up to, Len, that we've earned through the years, 108, 106, you know, we'll round it one way or the other. So we've been at it for a while. Um, so we've earned a great deal of trust. Uh, but we understand that you have to re-earn that trust every day. We never take this for granted. And again, how do you do that? For us, we think this reliance on science is single, the most important. That once we kind of vary from that, the trust will become vulnerable. So, um, uh, you know, when you're facing marketing pressures and communication and fundraising pressures, having that anchor of, of what we believe scientifically truthful is very important. Uh, we're, we are perceived as a truth checker. So not just our content team, but multiple departments, virtually every science department at ACS, including our content team, cancer control, our medical and scientific group, our research group, our legal department, our communications department, we are all involved in the business of being a truth checker. Um, uh, so what are some of the implications of that? And they're substantial. Uh, so just to give one example is causality. We're uh, it's a particular challenge. It's a very frequent question we're called about. You know, we live in this community. There's a big group of cancer. There's a something used, in, you know, the, in this community. Did that cause our cancer? Do electric wires cause cancer? So uh, we uh, do our best to gather the information, both from our own staff, through the literature, and through our volunteer partners to try to get the best science on those questions. Um, and we're often called, uh, called upon to address the most controversial emerging cancer-related issues of the day. Um, and so what happens, uh, you wouldn't be surprised to know, I think, is that our publicly facing information, which is intended for that, also shows up, not our primary goal, but we have to understand, in policy debates, in lawsuits, uh, in every type of media outlet, taken out of context, <laughs> you know, in context, I'll give you a great recent example. We have a, a, a statement on the use of ENDS, uh, e-cigarettes, electronic nicotine delivery uh, uh, systems, that we think is a terrifically balanced public health message. It's terrifically balanced until you're in the vape industry and only quote the sentence from it that you like. So um, you know, then it, it doesn't look so balanced when that occurs. But to us, that's just an absolutely expected and phenomenon of trying to provide balanced information. Uh, let me comment a little bit about working with the media. So we respond to the media every day, uh, and this is comprehensively. It's both national uh, and local. Uh, and one of the things we do, and I'm sure we're not unique in this, but to me it's very critical when you're talking about media interaction, is we ask our science and experts to bring their own expertise and avoid, we avoid responding with our official position. Uh, our, our, so, and we engage our experts throughout the organization. If you, there's no one person who speaks for ACS. We go to all of our experts. Um, anybody can read an official position on cancer.org, but our experts uh, add value to the, and they try to put the 
communication with the media in ways that can be understood and synthesized. Uh, we try to view our interaction with the media through a public good lens. Uh, so we're always trying to keep in mind the public good, uh, but we will respond to any top, almost any question, almost any question on any topic, um, always through that lens. Uh, but we're well aware that in the current landscape, controversy sells papers. And then I thought about that phrase, said, I think we're selling fewer papers. So it generates retweets and anything else you could imagine on how you interact with the media. Um, there are still some papers out there as well, of course. Um, that's frustrating for all of us that we can write a very careful, balanced statement. Uh, the reporter's not the one who writes the headlines, which really often will highlight where the controversy is, and that's a challenge. Uh, some of the challenges we're facing, all of us are facing. The number of dedicated health reporters has substantially declined. The people doing health reporting in the media are often general reporters who have this as an assignment. Uh, that's been difficult. Uh, as was discussed so well earlier, people choose their news outlets based on preconceived beliefs. Uh, so many people choose these that, you know, outlets that align with their pre preconceived notions. Uh, we do not have access to every one of those outlets, and we probably don't want to have access to every one of them. Um, and I cannot emphasize enough the importance of rep, uh, website searching. Uh, search engine, engine optimization is where it's at. And if you're not optimizing your search, uh, you're going to get a lot less hits. So we, we do do whatever we have to do that. And f just as I wrap up, so what does it take to do all this? Resources are always a challenge. I don't know exactly how much we spend on information. This is a minimal estimate, lowest level, at least $30 million a year. Uh, when you count everybody's in-kind effort, it's certainly more than that. And we're well aware that most organizations don't have that capacity, and we take this responsibility incredibly seriously. Uh, but it does mean it's part of our fundraising goal every year, and we don't dedicate it to this, but we know we have to meet it. Uh, and then finally, the right social media strategy is incredibly difficult, and we're happy to talk about that in the panel. Let me just end with these two comments. We recognize that even the best, most accurate information cannot overcome the structural barriers to accessing high quality care. It's one part of it, but just one part. We must consider information as not just a cancer problem, but as one that requires us to address the social determinants of health more broadly. Thank you so much.